Well, Trish, let's go right back to the start. You were born in Bristol. Um, how did you, you know, initially get into the game? Uh, well, I was born in Bristol, but we only lived there for um, a, a brief time. So really, I was brought up in Westwood Ho in North Devon. Um, and I was lucky enough to live a couple of miles from Royal North Devon, which is, in my opinion, probably one of the best golf courses in the world. Um, I had three older brothers that all played, and my dad played. And pretty much I did everything my youngest brother did. So myself and Alex played tennis, we played football, we played badminton. And when he started playing golf, I figured, well, it must be time to play golf. So I took it up there. My middle brother, Brian, was a very good player. He was a professional for a while. Uh, and just, yeah, it just really escalated from there. I mean, you had a, a wonderful amateur career. I mean, I was looking through it. I mean, it's, <laughs> what didn't you win, really? England under 23, under 21 champion, England amateur champion, and then the Curtis Cup. I think you won four out of four points in, in 1986. I mean, when did you know you were definitely going to be a pro? When I was 13. I was a seven handicap at 13, and I just always knew I was going to play. I didn't really know why, you know, at that age, I think you just, but I, yeah, I just always knew. I was, I loved tennis more than anything. That was my, probably, what I loved doing. But where we lived, it was a bit remote, and we had to travel quite a long way. We had to go to Exeter, massive place for us, about 45 miles away. So every weekend, my dad used to take me, as I, was, I think I was about 10. I used to go for sort of county training, if you like, as a 10-year-old. And I really loved it, but it was, it was a case of with tennis, play tennis and nothing else. And at 10, Dad said, you know, do you want to do that? And I said, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm going to play everything. So we stopped, basically stopped doing that. I just played tennis for fun uh, and golf became more important. And I was pretty good at it. So I just carried on doing it. You certainly were. I mean, you turned pro in 1987 and then straight away you start picking up the trophies. I mean, it was three wins, wasn't it, in your first year? Uh, rookie of the year as well. Was it a surprise to you that you started, you know, so well? Do you know what, looking back, I don't even think I thought about it. It wasn't a surprise because, you know, to me, you turn professional to win things. And I was very fortunate as a, as a you know, I came up through in an era where Laura and uh, Big Al and, you know, they were perennial winners. Um, and I just looked at them and thought, well, you know, that's what you do. If you turn pro, you just win. So I, I didn't, I was very lucky. I didn't have to think about it long. Uh, I lost, I think I lost in a, I can't remember my, I think I lost in a playoff before I won a playoff in, in about my fourth event. So I was very fortunate that I won early on. And I think once you do that, you have a totally different mentality. Um, and you probably have different expectations and you just expect to keep winning. And I was very lucky to, to win three in my first year. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible start. And then there's a slight gap until 1990. And then you came back. Uh, very strong. It was a four wins there, wasn't it? And you won the, your, your first order of merit. How, how was that feeling to, to, you know, officially finish top of the rankings? Yeah, that was a wonderful, wonderful year. Um, my whole career has been very strange in that I've had big gaps within, you know, three years without winning. And, and often some really awful years, you know, some really... I, met, I remember my... I think my first year on tour in the States, I missed 11 cuts on the trot. You know, and at, at that stage, you sort of, you do begin to wonder, you know, whether you're ever going to uh, achieve anything, really. Um, but 1990 just seemed to be, I, I, I get one of, the, I'm one of those people that just clicks. When, it, when I have a good run, I have a good run. And, and you can see when I have a bad run, I have a bad run. Um, so that was a wonderful feeling. I think I won the very last event uh, on a very, very tricky golf course. I think it was in, it might have been in Cannes, actually, uh, to finish ahead of Helen Alfredson. Um, and yeah, it was just, I think you sort of feel like it's your, your destiny. Um, but it was a wonderful feeling to win the money list. It's the only time I've done it, which is, you know, disappointing, but uh, something that you can't take away. Mm, well, you've come close many times since. I mean, it was quite a year, 1990 as well, wasn't it? It was the, it was the first ever edition of the Solheim Cup. And, and there you were. I mean, that, looking back now, you just think you were part of the, you know, the start of such a great tournament. That must really make you feel you know, very proud in some ways. Yeah, I think 1990 was an extraordinary um, event, really. Um, even getting the thing underway was, uh, you know, amazing. But it was a bit of like a, a who's who of women's golf against St. Trillians. That's pretty much how I would describe it. And to be fair, the whole week was, uh, yeah, we were pretty soundly trounced. Um, one man and his dog were watching, if you like. I think it was in Lake Nona. Um, but it was an experience that, you know, I think, again, I, I go back to Laura played, uh, Big Al played, Helen Alfredson, Lotta Neumann and myself. And I think all of us played at least six to eight Solheim Cups. 
Um, so it was the mainstay of you know the team for a good few years, and some good camaraderie. You know, it was good fun. Even though we we got soundly trounced, we were playing against you know Nancy Lopez and Pat Bradley and Betsy King and you know people in their prime and, and a load of other fantastic players. Um, and it was a memory that you you know you you didn't want to repeat. Uh, in that we did, we got beaten, uh, but you wanted to play in again, and obviously um, 92 was the sort of you know it was the icing on the cake. Absolutely, leads me on nicely. 1992. I mean, you're talking about the great players that you were playing uh, against the American side. Uh, Patty Sheehan was, was Patty one yeah. U.S. and British Open champion at the time, and you know you delivered, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, Dan Mahoy was. Oh, God, it was the weirdest experience. Um, we had lots of uh, things happening that week. I mean, very unfortunately, uh, Kathy Whitworth's mother died that week, and she was the American captain. So, obviously, they were on a you know it was a really quite somber occasion to a certain extent. But I think with with Kathy not there, uh, that gave us um, I mean it, for the wrong way, but it gave us a bit of a lift, obviously, because she was a, a an utter superstar. Uh, Alice Miller did, took over and did a very good job, but we had other things. There was a uh, Beth Daniel made a comment um, that that and and actually she probably said the truth, but uh, that no one in the European team apart from Laura would get in the American team, and she wasn't far from the truth. But it, it's not the sort of thing you need to say to roll people up. That helped us, um, and I think just you know they were on on a real sort of low, and we were on a real high. Uh, the golf course suited us. We had. In, internal problems, possibly with the chief executive at the time, Jenny names, but uh, and we we made it. Um, how could you say we made it uh, fun about that? Um, we had uniforms that didn't fit. We had you, you name it. I mean, this was really St. Trinian's, you know. And and if I can put it into perspective, let's just say uh, that you would have got better odds on Leicester winning the Premiership than you would have on us beating the Americans that week. So, I mean, you've played in so many Solheim Cups. I think it's seven, isn't it, in the end? It's eight, excuse me. Um, if you could choose any of those as your favourite, would that be the one, or would you choose another that you look back and really think, wow, you know, that's a week that I'd always cherish? I, I think that one would be by far and away because of the result, because it was such a ridiculous result, and just, you know, no one in their right mind would have put a pound on it. Um, the only thing I will say is that, that Loch Lomond... Uh, for me personally, was was an amazing experience. Probably it's the best I've played, and uh, apart from my perennial thrashing by Doddy Pepper, which I got every two years, probably for about four or five five times, um, I didn't lose a point. I had some incredible matches, and just the atmosphere. You have to remember back in the early days, even at Damalhoy, there were very few. There was crowds, but nothing as big. Suddenly, Loch Lomond kind of changed that a bit. There were thousands of people there. The atmosphere was something special. So I think to win in that environment was, uh, you know, something that I, I will cherish. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. I, I, I've, your, your career on the Ladies' European Tour just, just carries on and on and on. I mean, you start in the 80s, you won. In the 90s, you won. In the noughties, you won. And in this current decade, you won. Obviously, you've also won in the States as well. What's the, what's the secret of your, your longevity? It's a very good question. Uh, I think, in general, I love sport. So my whole life has been uh, about sport. And I, I don't kind of understand the... I'm defined by being a golfer. That's what I am. And I will be until the day I die. All the... Uh, you know, the, the world has changed. I understand that totally. So, well, one, I still need to play golf because I need to earn a living. But... I love playing, I love trying to win. I love trying, and, and now, to a certain extent, you know, playing against the youngsters, it's, it's obviously more of a challenge because they hit it further, they're much fitter, whatever, but I, I think it's um, the only way I can sort of describe it. And the, the girls these days, they, they get fit to play golf. In our day, you played golf, to, you know, you played sport to get fit, the other way round. And I just think that you know, with all the miles you travel, all the practice balls you hit, it's very difficult to have a career that's going to last for 30, 40 years if you're working out so hard and you're putting such strain on your body as a, as a young woman. Um, 
And maybe the love of sport isn't the same, um, because for people to, so many people these days are just retiring. I totally understand retiring, having a family, having kids, getting married, totally get that. But, but for the ones that aren't doing that and just want to do something else, I don't get that, because that means to me you were never kind of defined by being a golfer. And I don't think we're any different to the men. You know, we're golfers all our lives. And I can, the only, only way I can ever see not competing is one, if I'm not physically capable, or two, if I can't win. Yeah, no, it's interesting you pick up about the, the physical aspect because I, if I compare the tennis, for instance, to golf, the amount of uh, female tennis players that retire young, if they're having families or not, is, is quite remarkable when you compare it to golf. Obviously, there's different physical you know, attributes you need to play tennis compared to golf, but is it also like the social aspect of golf and the, and the, the type of game it is that makes you want to sort of continue to play on? Yeah, um, yeah maybe. Um, yeah, I think just, you know, golf is such a social game anyway. You know, I mean, tennis, in all honesty, I would say exactly what you just hit on. It's such a physical, you've got to be so physically fit. I mean, that's not a case of you can do what we do. You have to be physically fit, otherwise the other person's going to trounce you. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, you look at, I read an article this morning, Mark Leishman, so he hasn't been to a gym for however long, but he's, he's looking like he possibly could win the FedEx Cup against the most you know, amazing physical specimens that you'll ever play against. So golf's a mind game as well, isn't it? Let's be fair. I mean, 90% 90, 90 of it is played in the mind. If you think you're the best, regardless of whether you are or not, you probably will win. Um, I don't think that's the case in tennis because there is a physical attribute you need. It, it, it's almost the opposite. If you, can, if you can prove you're physically stronger than the other person, you'll probably beat them. I think that's the case with golf whatsoever. And it being such a, a social game where, you know, millions of people play it or they think on the same level as you anyway, even if they're not in the professional um, side of the game, that, yeah, it's just very different. But I, I don't know, I, I, as I said earlier, I just see it as, um, I can't ever imagine the day when I'm not competing, uh, up here anyway. Um, as I said, with the, with the physical side, who knows? And I've been fairly lucky, not so, you know, obviously the more you age you sort of feel creaks and pains and all sorts but um, yeah I mean I don't, I don't see any reason you don't get you don't get any less competitive because you get older you just find it harder and you have to find ways around that but I'm no less competitive now than I was when I was you know when I first turned pro I want to win I probably want to win more than I did back then have you had to adapt your game as you've got older No, I don't think so. I think just, you know, Father Time takes its, <laughs> you know, it just makes you, you've got more memories. This is the problem, and that's why I say it's in the head, that there are more, it doesn't matter how many times you win, you've got more years of bad things happening, clearly, than you've had good, and, and that's why, you know, players don't get better putting and short game as they get older, because they have more memories of bad things happening. Um, so you have to, I think it's, it's harder mentally than, than, than physically, uh, assuming your body is still, you know, capable of swinging a golf club. Yourself and obviously Laura Davis, you know, the main stage of this tour, um, golden generation really. What do you think of the current generation that have come through? You've had Charlie Hull recently, I'm talking British golf specifically here, Georgia Hall, uh, and recently, how, how do you view that the sort of talent that's coming through now to the talent that came through when you broke through? It's a really difficult question. It's like, you know, the, the age old, you know, comparing footballers of different eras. It's so hard to say. Listen, bottom line is Laura was number one in the world. She's the best golfer, a British golfer that I've ever seen and was probably the best golfer I've ever played with and will ever play with. Um, so I would say they've got a hell of a lot to live up to. You know, Big Al, she won US Open. She deprived Nancy of ever winning a US Open and won a British Open. So you have to say that until the likes of Charlie um, uh, put, put that on their CV, then, you know, they're, they're not up there. I mean, obviously, because the way the world has changed, they're now superstars without being superstars yet. They have all the talent in the world. And Georgia, I think she will be a, a champion, big champion, because she has, she wants it really wants it. I don't know about Charlie because I don't know Charlie well enough. She's got a fantastic game. Um, but you know, she's, she's been out there a few years and she's won a couple of times. But uh, you know, I think people forget there's a big difference between winning a few 
and winning 20 or 30 or winning majors. I mean, I've never won a major, so I don't put myself in, in Laura or Ali's class. Obviously not Laura's, but n not even in Ali's class because she won a US Open and British Open. I've never been close to winning those. Um, that's something very different, as Lotta did, as Alfie did. Uh, and, and in this day and age, we're very quick to say, make people superstars before they are. Mm. Do you think it's harder uh, with the, obviously the rise of the Korean players, and not just Koreans, also Japanese players, etc., etc., China? I think it's harder now to win a major than it was perhaps you know, 20, 30 years ago. Again, I, re I haven't played in, in America full time since 2002, so I find that very difficult to, to answer. I, I find it hard to believe there were better players now than the Lopez's in their prime and, and all the people I mentioned previously. However, there are so many of them, um, so many good players. And, and it, as I say, it's a really difficult question to answer when I, I haven't played with uh, um, a lot of the uh, you know, top superstars now. Um, and I forgot to mention Annika Sorensen, obviously, uh, another European player that, I mean, beyond belief what she won. So, uh, as I say, was anybody better than those? You know, the, the current number ones? I don't think so. But just the sheer amount of top players probably, um, you know, makes it incredibly hard to win a major. Having said that, they'll win them. If they're, if they're good enough, they'll win them. If you could take a golfer to one side and, you know, with your knowledge of what you've done in your career so far, what, what sort of advice would you give to a young golfer just starting out as a pro? I'd say the most important thing, especially in the modern era, is to know your game and know what you want. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I see an awful lot of players almost, uh, how could you put it, they let people take over their lives. So I've, I've always been very, I've had an awful lot of, of guys teach me. Um, and the reason for that is once I'm not getting better, then, you know, golf is a short career. Uh, you, you need to find someone that, you know, can help you. And you need to do it, you know. <clears throat> you often hear, you've got to get worse to get better. And that's the biggest load of rubbish I've ever heard in my entire life. For a professional, it makes no sense. You get better, you know, ne not necessarily in tournaments, but you'll get better practice-wise, you know, hitting the ball, learning what you're trying to do very quickly if you have talent, if you're being taught the right way. And you need to understand it. But you need to... You need to take control of uh, a teaching situation. So if, if a teacher is just telling you what to do and you're just blindly doing it, and then that's it, and you're off and then you go away on your own and the teacher's not there anymore, suddenly everything, and I, I've first-hand experience of that. I used to have, have lessons where I would be fantastic on the range. And then that teacher wasn't there anymore. I'd go to America and two days later I'd think, my God, what's happened? I can't hit it. I'm not, because I had, I was literally being told what to do and no comprehension of really what I was doing. You need to make sure that you're, you know enough about what you're trying to do to get that teacher to do what you want them to get you to do, if you understand what I mean. You mustn't just blindly let, and, and sometimes, you know, it's difficult. There are so many pros these days, <coughs> excuse me, teaching pros who, it's like they need to reinvent themselves to keep up with the times. Well, how do you do that? Well, you keep trying to get someone better, and sometimes trying to get someone that's very, very good better is just a time thing. It's learning how to win thing. It doesn't necessarily mean it's got to be changing all, you know, the facets of your swing. And um, I would really, yeah, that's the one thing I would say to young players. Make sure you know what you want in your golf swing. You said you still want to win. You know, you're still very driven, determined to do well in golf. But what realistically are your career aims now in golf? I mean, what do you want to win now? I'd like to get to 30 wins. I'd see that as, uh, you know, that's a pretty okay career from what um, I need another five, I think. If you include the Legends Tour events, which I do because they're events and they're, you know, they're, they're championships. Um, and, you know, and actually some of those have, have been probably my most pleasurable because they're playing against the you know, the superstars that uh, made the LPGA what it is today. Um, so, yes, if I could get to 30, 30 wins, and I think that's another five, I'd see that as, as something to be, you know, fairly proud of. Very proud of. I have to ask this. 
I know you've captained the Queen's Cup. I know you've told me before that you're not interested at all in, in you know, captaining the Solheim Cup team. Is that still the case, Trish? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. That's just not my. No, I think those you know days have have, have gone. And, and to be fair, I don't know any of the players as well. They're they're all LPGA players. You know, I'm I've played on the European Tour since 2002, so I'm well out of touch with all of them. I hardly know any of them. So I think it's very difficult to to, to captain a team where basically you're captaining a team of strangers. Um, <laughs> you've done a lot of media work um, over the last few years, doing for Sky, for the Solheim actually, and, and so for the British Open I, I heard you doing some comms as well, which you're you know, very good at, um, because of your honesty uh, and your, you, know, you have opinions which people want to listen to. Is that something that you want to do more of in the future? Um, I'll be per perfectly honest, I'd love to do more in the studio. I'll be damned if I'm doing it on the golf course. Because I, it's one thing walking around a golf course playing. That's the easiest thing in the world. Walking around a golf course commentating on other people playing golf, no, it's not my idea of fun. And as you, you rightly said, at the British Open, um, there was a bit of fun going on because Laura was the one up there who was sat there in the nice warm studio and I was the one outside that was getting absolutely lashed on in the freezing cold and pouring rain. And she thought it was extremely funny. And uh, yeah, I can see her point of view, but I couldn't see my point of view at all. So... Truthfully, on a golf course, and do you know what? It's just hard work. It's, it's amazing. It, it really brings home to you how adrenaline, when you're playing golf yourself, there's no tiredness there's because you're, you're, you're in it. If you could change anything about golf, what do you think that would be? Not just women's golf, golf, golf more in general, i.e. it can be you know, the rules of the game or the speed of the game or you know, anything you really think you can put your finger on. What would be the, the sort of main change you would like to see that you think would make golf a better game? Without doubt, the speed of the game, it's utterly appalling. And if you can't get round in under four hours, actually, if you can't have a bit of respect for the fact that there are people waiting behind you, the, the only thing we learn as amateurs, if anybody's waiting, get out of the way. And, you know, I played a practice round, and I understand to a certain extent why people do this, because they're all waiting. But like playing a practice round yesterday, having to wait on every single shot because the players in front are taking their time putting to every which way they want to putt because they're waiting. Well, the first group, that comes down to the first group. So the first group out there waiting, uh, playing, as soon as they see someone behind, get off, get out of the way, because that's etiquette. The etiquette of the game has just gone out the window. No one gives a damn anymore about them, anybody but themselves. And that's the speed of the game. That's why the speed of the game is like it is. No one cares about anybody else waiting. It's unbelievable. And if I could, I think if we could change the speed of play, we'd have a whole different bunch of people wanting to watch golf and get involved in golf because the speed of it is utterly appalling. And it's the spectators as well. I mean, you can wait for ages for someone to hit a shot. And you know, it ruins the spectators um, experience as well when they want to come and watch live golf. But how would you, how would you actually go about enforcing people play quicker? Would you put them on the clock each time? I mean, how would you do it? You just quite simply, at the start of the season, say, we're going to be the tour that is different. And I think this is a great chance, actually, for the LET to be the tour that is different because the LPGA is appalling. I mean, they're way worse than us, which is truly saying something. But at the start of the year, you just say to the players, right, the times are changing. The time is no longer four hours, 20 minutes for the first group. It's four hours. And you learn to adapt. And if you don't adapt, you get fined. Or you get, actually, no fining needs to go out the window. <clears throat> you get a you get, uh, short penalty because that costs more. And you'd be amazing how, how, how quickly it will adapt people to, uh, to that scenario. And if we were the tour that did that, I mean, you're quite right. When I was commentating, you realise how long people... And Solheim Cup is a truly extraordinary thing to do because you're talking about the best players in the world there. They are truly sensational golfers. And they're standing over a 90-yard 90, 90 pitch throwing up grass, thinking, well, I'm, there's no grass, there's no wind. OK, so it's 90 yards. How many clubs can it be? Just, I, it, it's just gone out the window. And... You hear crowds, you hear people saying, oh God, isn't this boring, isn't it this? Yeah, it is. They're absolutely right. So why can't we be the tour that decides we're going to change that? If you're the first group out, let's get out there in, in under four hours. And then obviously that has a knock-on effect to everybody else that's playing. And I think that would be truly a sensational um, you know, thing to do for our tour. Well, Trish, I think you have a lot of support in that. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, Trish.